Well, Good morning. The committee on parole is called to order. The time is 9 12. Uh, panel members today are Mr. Alvin Roche, uh, Mr. Pete Freeman. My name is Tony Marabell. I'll be acting as chair. Our remote location this morning is Franklin Parish Detention Center. With the staff at Franklin Parish, please introduce themselves. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Sammy Burns with Franklin Parish Detention Center. Thank you very much. Uh, our first case is going to be Mr. Steve Alms. Mr. Alms, uh, would you please introduce yourself and give us your DOC number? My name is Steve Alms, and my DOC number is 600141. Mr. Alms, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then we're going to have a parole interview with you. Uh, at the appropriate time, uh, we will allow those persons who wish to have input to speak. Uh, speaking uh, on your behalf today is Ms. Mandy Hill, uh, and in opposition is Mr. Randy Meyer with the District Attorney's Office in uh, Jefferson Parish. Uh, at the end of that uh, hearing, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say to the board, uh, and then we'll vote. You understand our procedure? Yes, sir. This is the matter of Steve L. Alms. DOC number 600141. Mr. Holmes, his date of birth is May 1st of 1976. He's classified as a sixth felony offender. He has a, uh, he's not eligible for good time. He has full term date of February the 7th of 2027. He is serving a five year term for the, for the charges of simple burglary as a habitual offender, having been sentenced on September the 19th of 2022. Is all of that accurate, uh, Mr. Holmes? Yes, sir. Mr. Holmes, your case has been uh, assigned to me, so I will begin our interview process. Uh, Mr. Holmes, how old are you, sir? I'm 47 years old. How long have you been in prison on these charges? Um, I have been in 16 months, sir, between the parish and here. Tell me why you're in prison right now on these charges. Tell me what you did. Um, well, I made a bad decision and tried to steal some copper to get some extra money and was caught. It was a stupid thing to do. Tell me a little bit about your educational background. Um, well, I went to high school in Florida and I got a GED the first time I was arrested in 96. And I've been just doing carpenter training and things like that. Um, had had a successful, you what, know. What um, grade did you did you quit high school? Tenth grade. Tenth grade. Yes, sir. Why did you quit? Uh, because I was working, strung out on drugs. Tell me a little bit about uh, your drug history. When did you start using drugs? Um, when I was about seventeen, 
and I was a full-time addict till about 2000. Let's slow down. Let's slow down. 17 years old, what did you start using? Uh, marijuana. All right. Um, yeah. I, where did you progress to? Um, cocaine and heroin. When, when, tell me a little bit about that progression. You started out smoking marijuana. How often were you smoking marijuana? Um, just a little bit recreationally at first, and then it became every day. And then, you know, slowly over time. So I was introduced to cocaine and then I get too strung out on that. So I do the heroin to come down and it became a vicious cycle. How often were you doing these drugs? Um, pretty much daily, sir. Uh, I'm looking at your, your record. You've had at least 23 arrests. Uh, you've got criminal records in Louisiana, Texas, Florida, Washington, and South Carolina. Multiple felony and misdemeanor convictions. Uh, yes, tell me about that. Tell me why so much crime. I mean, well, I hear uh, you're a drug addict, but you know, you said you worked. But did you ever have a job? I I did have a job, sir, but I'd be too strung out to go to work, so I would make poor decisions. And you know, I um, I've never been sentenced to this much time, and I just. I never tried to do anything different until the last time I was arrested. I entered the drug court program and that did me a, a lot. I, um, I learned a lot and I, I graduated drug court successfully in 2017 and the drugs have pretty much come to an end since then. Where did you, when did you graduate drug court? Where at? At Plaquemines Parish, 2017. Well, when did you get arrested on the charges that you're in jail for? 2020, sir. I thought you said the drugs came to an end after you finished drug court. Yes, sir. It, I, the drugs didn't have anything to do with this. I just made a bad decision trying to get some extra you didn't, money. You didn't tell the police when they arrested you that you had been using heroin that day? Yes, sir. But well, I had wasn't, been? I had been, but I had not been strung out on it. I just it had a relapse. I had been doing well for myself until... Okay, so let, let, me, let me slow you down. You're a drug addict. You quit doing drugs after you finished drug court. Yes, sir. You had a relapse, so yes, you don't sir. consider that to be a problem. Well, when you yes. quit doing drugs after 2017. You yes, did. Yes, sir. What were you doing after drug court to stay off of drugs? I was going to meetings and I had a sponsor and I was working my program. And then and so why did you stop? Well, I made the decision. I made a bad decision and thought that I had it under control. And so I quit doing those things and then it came back. So what do you think about that? Uh, what I do think, you think the answer to this is? Well, I need to stay in my meetings and stay on my program. How long were you in the programs after drug court? I was in the program for about two years. How often, when was the last time you went to an AA meeting or an NA meeting prior to your arrest in 2020? About six months. I'm sorry? About six months, sir. So you quit going to your meetings after about six months, and why? I thought I had it under control. I, I thought I had it under control, even though the program had taught me that I never would. I needed to stay with it. Something in my head told me that you know, another, yet another bad decision told me that I could handle it without the help. What, if any, kind of programs have you taken while you've been in prison? Um, well, sir, I've only, I'm have only i in the honor dorm as a, as a trustee. I don't meet the criteria to take any of the classes because I have too much time is what I've told. But I have still, I have, I have requested thinking for a change, parenting, and reentry, sir. But they say that I have too much time. I'm too far down the list. Mr. Holmes, uh, you're 47 years old. You're a sixth felony offender. Yes, sir. Uh, you've taken some drug programs. Uh, you 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 go back to using drugs. I mean, you, you you're kind of downplaying the fact that that. You know, you say, oh, I was just a little relapse. What the relapse? I mean, you got arrested. You're in prison. Uh, are you telling me that's the only time you relapse after you quit going to your meetings? No, sir. It was about the third or fourth one. So you were back on drugs again. I was on my way full time, yes, sir. 
uh, and, and typically a drug user, an abuser, and an addict is going to downplay their drug use. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. And I started questioning you. You said, you know, I quit doing drugs in 2017. Yeah. And because I had the police report, because I knew what you had said, I questioned you about the heroin. And then yeah, you sir. finally admitted that. Yes, yeah, sir. You were back strung out on drugs again, weren't you? You were sound asleep when they caught you, laying down in the field. Yes, sir. We can both agree that you were back strung out on drugs? I was, yes, sir. I was on my way. I wasn't full blown strung out, but it wouldn't have been long, sir. So, what do we need to do to prevent that from happening again? You're asking me and this board to let you out early. Yes, sir. So you can go back to doing what? Um, well, go back to my meetings. I've already been in touch with my old sponsor who's willing to take me back. <clears throat> His name is Mike G. And um, he lives, I'm moving to a different location to be with my daughter and stay on my meetings and my program. And I'm gonna try to volunteer at the old drug court facility. They take alumni people. And uh, then Mr. Judge Connor he said I could come back anytime and speak and sit in with them. I'm just going to try to work and be with my family and do things a little different, sir. What I've learned while I've been here is that, you know, previously I wasn't concerned with my actions. I was only worried about myself and the things that I needed immediately or I thought that I needed immediately. And, and you know, my family and them need me now, but they needed me just as much then. And I didn't take that into consideration. And what I've learned is the things that I do don't just affect me, you know, right then they affect me in the long term and my family and the people around me. So, you know, um, those kind of things are what define a man. And I'm trying to <clears throat> make sure that my definition of myself is different, sir. You didn't learn those things in drug court? How long were you in drug court? About four years. Four years. Who was your judge? Judge Connor. You didn't learn those things while you were in drug court? You didn't realize those things while you were in drug court? Did you go see the judge every week? Yes, sir. You go to classes uh, three times a week, four times a week? Yes, sir. You got tested the whole time? Yes, sir. And you didn't realize what you telling me you now realize? Um, I heard it and it was planted in my head, but I didn't necessarily believe it at the time. Um, I think, I'll be honest, I, I gained the information, but I was just kind of trying to get by, sir. I, I guess, I guess while they say in the, in the meetings that I wasn't technically ready to receive that information, but, um, you know, this this time after, you know, our family is, is ill and things like that and all this time that I'm facing and I've been doing has made me realize, as you say, I'm 47 years old and I just don't I just don't have it in me anymore, sir. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Holmes. Uh, staff there, can you tell us anything about Mr. Holmes? Or how's his disciplinary record there? Oh. What, what can you tell us about this dog since he's been there? Sir, I'm sorry. What can you tell us about Mr. Alms since he's been there? As far as Mr. Alms myself, uh, sir, I've never had no issues with him myself. No write-ups at all that I know of. Uh, it's kind of just, I'm not going to say blended in, but I mean, he has the cause of us no trouble. Thank you. Yes, sir. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, sir. Any uh, now we'll hear from uh, Ms. Mandy Hill. Hello, sir. How are you? Doing fine. Thank you, ma'am. Would you introduce okay. yourself and tell us what you'd like us to know? Yes, sir. Um, so my name is Mandy. I'm 47. I met Steve um, back in 2012. He was in drug court. He was doing really well. He I learned a lot from him. Um, I did get clean when I met him. He helped me and I became pregnant. And we have a, she'll be 10 years old next month. Um, we have a daughter. Uh, she has Down syndrome and autism and she's nonverbal. And I take myself and it's a big job. And um, 
I really feel that she needs her father and I think he's ready to be a good father. And I think um, when he sees her, he'll fall in love with her. He was in her life for the first two years, but then um, like he said, he, you know, he fell off into the um, wrong, you know, he went back into the situation. It's, it's very, you know, it's very hard myself. I was an addict, but um, I, I know once he meets his daughter and he sees her, he will, um, he, he's got all the reasons to do well. I have a truck for him. Um, he's going to live in my home with um, my daughter and I have a truck ready for him and I have a job lined up for him. And um, I just hope that you'll let him come and be with me and his daughter. She really needs him. And um, it's, a, it's a lot for me to do on my own. You know, she's nonverbal and um, she's, she's maturing. Uh, you know, she's maturing really fast and she needs her dad. So um, if you would just consider that, please. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Randy Meyer. Good morning, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish. <laughs> I've listened to the interview with Mr. Holmes and, and I've got some real concerns. Um, I think he clearly needs some additional uh, substance abuse treatment programs. The, the last thing I'd like to see is him to get out and um, he'll be right back at it. And then he, he may end up, uh, you know, with the heroin and the fentanyl, that's like that stuff, and with the cocaine these days, he very well could end up dead. And it's something we don't want to see. I think clearly his responses uh, show that he needs more treatment. He needs to have more treatment. And I know the board has, has heard this from me before, but Mr. Holmes, I'm, I'm going to say I've got a friend who's an alcoholic for over 30 years. He's been going at AA meetings. He's a sponsor. Uh, he goes every week. He goes multiple times every week. He doesn't quit. He's never stopped. And it's something you can't do. You can't stop doing that. You got to maintain, you got to continue in your treatment and continue doing that for the rest of your life. Um, or you can have a bad consequence. So at this time, we're opposed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ryan. Mr. Alms, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote? Yes, sir. Um, I would just like to say thank you for your time. And I am definitely going to stay in the meetings and work with my sponsor if granted the chance to. I, um, I apologize for what I've done. You know, I wrote the victim an apology letter. I got no response. Um, you know, I, um, I definitely, I've already taken steps to make sure that I, my sponsor is in place and I'm going to do the right thing if given the chance. Thank you, sir. Yes. Mr. Holmes, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, earlier uh, in our interview that this is the first time you've ever done this kind of hard time. Yes, sir. Jail this long. Uh, I'm hoping that maybe it, it woke you up. You went through drug court. You said you were there for four years. Uh, I'm a former drug court judge. I was on the drug court for 14 years. Uh, Mr. Myers said something that resonated with me. Uh, we had several graduates uh, who uh, had completed the program. Yes, and within months, I was at their funeral because they thought, they had it with, and you never, you, you, you never whip it. It yeah. will take you over any opportunity it gets. You've got to stick with the program and you've got to stay with the program. Yes, uh, you've got some history with drug court. Uh, you know, my experience has always been when I was a drug court judge, that the more treatment you get, the more likely something is going to sink in. Uh, I hope you learned some basics. Uh, I'm willing to grant conditionally you're completing the long-term treatment program, Steve Hoyle. And the reason I do that is because you did go to drug court. You did complete that program successfully. And I think you've got a background that might be able to benefit you if you can get into long-term treatment right now and get and, and really understand deeply inside that you're an addict and it's a disease and you've got to control it. Otherwise, it will control you. Yes, sir. We're very fortunate, as Mr. Meyer pointed out, that 
heroin you were using wasn't laced with fentanyl, and you're not in a in a in a grave right now instead of in a prison. Yes, sir. So my vote today is to grant conditionally on your completing uh, the Steve Hall program, but not the long-term Steve Hall program. And when you are released, you are to be drug tested uh, randomly. You're to have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. You're to do three AA meetings per week. Yes, uh, I just want three votes, but that's my vote. Mr. Freeman? Um, I concur. You, you definitely have a serious problem. Uh, you have the basic treatment. Now it's time to put some finishing touches on it. Steve Hall is the best program we have. Uh, so uh, my vote is to grant conditional that upon you completing the Steve Hall long-term program. Thank you, Mr. Russia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Holmes, I see it a little differently. I sit and I listen intently. And Mr. Holmes, you are still in denial. You don't even think you're a drug addict. Mr. Marabella had to pull the information out of you. It was just that one time. And then it was that only two times, it was three times. You are back on Howard and you were trying to hide it. You've only been incarcerated 25% of your sentence. I don't think you're ready. I don't think you're even ready for Steve Hall. You have to make it up in your mind that when you go to Steve Hall, you're going to put 110% effort into that program, or it's not going to do you any good. You were in drug court for four years. And then when it ended and you graduated, you were back on drugs. You have to get your mind ready and you have to make up in that mind, it's time, I'm finished. And then you can be raised on an extensive criminal history, six felony convictions, opposition from the DA's office, opposition from law enforcement, and a light of rehabilitative programs, I'm going to deny your request. Two votes in the current situation. All right. Uh, Mr. Uh, Alms, you have two votes to grant, uh, one vote to deny. Uh, you haven't completed pre release, so under our rules, uh, your parole has been denied to me. I'm going to encourage you to take whatever programs are available to you, especially drug treatment programs. Uh, so you can move forward. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, sir. I think they left. I think they left. Hello. You know, it's it is definitely not every day that you. Uh, that you see Mr. Mirabella grant someone in this situation. And then, and then Mr. Roche out of all people, um, I shouldn't say out of all people, but then Mr. Roche, Mr. Roche to deny, I mean, basically Mr. Mirabella as the, 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 the drug court judge and expert, kind of expecting him to, to call him out the way that Mr. Roche did. That was just my expectation because I, I do feel the same way um, a, about him as Mr. O'Shea pointed out. Is my screen lagging? I feel like it is. Um, it's a little frustrating. It's a little frustrating. But... I and we'll do another hearing after this one, so we'll, we'll get another one in. But I, uh, I, I do agree. I mean, I think that I felt that he 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 was in denial. You know, the copper pipes thing—that's what he got arrested for. Um, 
and that's actually something I know a little bit about. I, in a previous lifetime, going back into the Great Recession, 2007, is when I started doing um, real estate in, in a pretty dangerous city in the US, probably a top 10 dangerous city uh, at the time, very close to Newark, New Jersey. And all of the homes there that were completely dilapidated, they would have the copper pipes ripped out. And there was actually a major problem because addicts would go in, rip the copper pipes out, sell it to the local whoever's buying it. Typically, like a lot of these local plumbing stores, they might make 50, 80, 100 bucks on damage that can cost twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and really, I don't think it should be these addicts that are getting arrested and locked up and thrown away. It need it needs to be the plumbing companies that are buying the pipes because, you know, they should know better. They should, and also they're they're double dipping because they're gonna get to sell to whoever's fixing the real estate, all of their replacement stuff. And they don't use copper anymore now. They use um, like the, the PVC piping, but still the plumbing store, you get it there. If they incentivize the destruction of the copper, they it's not even the money that they get to resell the copper for, but it's really, I think they're, um, they're, gonna, they're gonna make now 10, 15, 20 grand. On, on providing all the PVC piping and components to uh, to whoever is going to fix the house. So it, it is a big problem, but arresting the little guy and locking him up is whatever, a different conversation. Um, but if you, if you didn't have insurance or, you know, I mean, but I mean, the bottom line is it is causing a ton of damage. It's, it's an incredible amount of, 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 of money and whatnot that, that uh, yeah, it's a real problem. Um, but yeah, I was I was I think Mr. Jackson was right. I mean, he did he did look to be in denial to me, and you know you have to feel bad for his was it his wife or was it his just his girlfriend? I you know having having a child under those circumstances that she's left alone to deal with, but. I don't feel like the parole board or Mr. Roche was doing this to punish him. Of course, it was doing it to help him um, and to look out for him. As, as and, 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 you know, Randy Meyer, I give him a hard time a lot, but I, I think he was right, too. And I think he was saying this. Um, it, you know, he brings up his friend who goes to AA and he has a point. Uh, this guy he was in denial. He was lying to the board, really. They had to like pull it out of him. I was just surprised Mr. Marabella kind of went for it. But anyways, that's just my opinion. Let's go to the next hearing. Go. Um, oh, right. That's how we do it. And let's go. The Committee on Parole is called back to order. The time is 9.37. Our next case is Mr. Eric Moore. Mr. Moore, would you please give us your full name and uh, DOC number? You're on mute, so see if someone can unmute your microphone. Okay, so would you introduce yourself and give us your DOC number? Good morning. My name is Eric Moore, DOC number 475-706. Mr. Moore, let me explain our process to you. Uh, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then we're going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will allow those participants who've indicated they wish to speak to have their input. Uh, speaking today on your behalf uh, is uh, a friend, Mr. Eddie Moore. Uh, well, three friends, Mr. Eddie Moore, Ms. Dana Bickham, and Mr. Douglas Delaney. 
Uh, Jim Williams, your attorney, is also here. Speaking in opposition is Mr. Randy Meyer with the District Attorney's Office in Jefferson Parish, uh, Ms. Nancy Norman, and Mr. Rodney Norman to be speaking today. At the end of that hearing, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say to the board, and then we'll vote. Do you understand our procedure, sir? Yes, sir. This is the matter of Eric Moore. You'll see number, <clears throat> excuse me, 475-706, date of birth, August the 4th of 1979. He is a fourth class felony offender. He has parole eligibility date of November the 24th of 2023. He is not eligible for good time. He has a full time release date of November the 25th of 2038. He is currently serving a 20 year sentence on the charges of uh, three counts of simple burglary, one of which having been adjudicated a habitual offender and illegal possession of stolen things, having been sentenced in all of those occasions on February the 8th of 2022. Mr. Moore, is, is that information accurate? Yes, sir. Mr. Moore, your case has been assigned to Mr. Pete Freeman. Would you please answer any questions he may have? Thank you. Yes. Uh, how old are you, Mr. Moore? 43, sir. Okay, and how long have you served on this sentence? I've been in jail four years and uh, eight months. Okay. Um, I see that uh, you had a disciplinary write-up. What was that about in 2023? I never had a disciplinary write-up, sir. Why were you moved for disciplinary reasons? That's just what they annotated on it. I never had a disciplinary write-up, sir. Never. Is that true, uh, Franklin? Franklin, right. Yeah, yeah, who is? I think you need to give him your headphones. Good morning again, Jim. Has he had any disciplinary write-ups? We have a record that would suggest he had a disciplinary write-up on his record. Does he uh, have any disciplinary write-ups? As of here at the. Franklin Parish, sir, I'm not aware of any disciplinary write-ups here. Okay. What was the date, Pete? Uh, 2 8 23. That was back How in February. How long has he been in Franklin? Um, I've, I've got I've got here on uh on I want to say the sixth of uh the sixth of February. You said the sixth of February is when he got here. That's what that's what the transfer that's when it happened. Uh, and it was at probably was at Plaquemines Parish Detention Center. So you had no write ups at Plaquemines? No, sir. I never had a write up. Okay. Um, there's no way we can check that. Just Marabella. Okay. All right. So Marabella. Going with the yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. I saw that in the record, and I had asked Sheree about that because uh, obviously he would have been removed if that was the case. She advised me, she looked into it and advised me that that was an error. Okay. Thank, Thank you, me. Mr. Morris. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mr. Moore, then let's let's get into it. Okay. Um, you had tons of simple burglary. Uh, you had Miss Nancy Norman was a victim. You ransacked the house, stole jewelry and a pistol. Uh, you were caught selling some of her stuff. Uh, Matilda Wimberly, you did pretty much the same thing. All of them, you did pretty much the same thing. Uh, DNA ID'd you. Uh, McAllister, uh, you got $3,700 from a safe. Wayne's uh, Stano, Bobby's Snowball Stand, $500 taken. Uh, no Food and Spirit, $8,700 taken. Golden Corral, $13,000 taken. It, it just goes on and on and on. Um, why were you doing these burglaries? So I have no excuse for why I committed those crimes. I wasn't knowing no drugs. I never had a drug problem. I take full responsibility for all those crimes I've committed. And I'm deeply, deeply sorry for all those crimes I've committed. I have no excuse whatsoever i can't i can't begin to tell you why i committed those crimes because there was nothing deterring my mental to 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 do those things but 
I just never thought that I could spend the rest of my life in jail, like I, you know, in a position to do right, of doing right now. Like I don't have no room for error in jail or out of jail. Like I said, sir, I just, I'm deeply sorry for committing those crimes. I'm, I so have a, no drugs, no alcohol problem. No, sir. I don't even smoke cigarettes, sir. Okay. Um, looks like you have two detainers, one of them with the Hammond Police Department uh, is still active. And then you have one out of Austin, Texas, which they only was going to extradite within the state of Texas. Uh, what are those two detainers about? Are they burglary charges also? This is my first time hearing about a detainer, sir. I've uh, I've got all my paperwork stating that I don't have a detainer. I have it with me. It's my first time hearing about a detainer, sir. It was in the pre throw. You need to check on that. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, you, you got an extensive uh, adult record. You uh, You've been on supervision eight times. You've been revoked four of those times. And one period was terminated unsatisfactorily. I mean, what was your problem under supervision? I just never could make it. I just never could make it through because I kept getting arrested. And that was the problem. I never could make it through because I kept getting arrested. But like I say, sir, the awareness that I have today, because I never spent this much time in jail and I never, I never had a life sentence, basically a life sentence hanging over my head. So the awareness that I have today is, is, is uncanny. It's just, I just never thought I could be placed in a position like this. I, I don't have an excuse and I'm, I'm not giving an excuse. I just never thought that I can be placed in a position like this. And being being in jail this long, like I said, I've never been in jail this long. Like I have a CD, I have a CDL license. I've been working. I worked for I drove for several companies, but there was a warrant that popped up in 2013, which, which, which caused me to get fired. And there it went from there, sir. But now the awareness that I have now and with this time that I have now hanging over my head is just I don't have any room for error because even in jail if I get a disciplinary I won't I won't have the opportunity to be free again even if I'm free if I do anything I have I have a 20 year sentence like it's, it, it's not going anywhere so yeah. I'm fully aware of of, of of what's what's at stake, and I have four daughters, and I have I have a family. I, I'm I'm fully aware of what's at stake. Let's move on. I understand. I understand. Um, your four daughters. Do you have any contact with them? Yes, sir. How often you you speak with them? You would say at least three times a week. That's good. Stay in their lives. Um. Looking at the opposition, you have uh, opposition from the sheriff, uh, opposition from the chief of police, uh, opposition from uh, Miss Wimberly. Uh, uh, that's one of your victims. Uh, Miss Norman, you have opposition from her. Uh, we had a lot of no comments. Bobby Snowball, you had opposition from them. Uh, Copeland, you had opposition from them. So you, you got quite a few victims that are opposed, and, and um, I believe you can understand why. I mean, yeah, absolutely. You disrupted sir. their business, you disrupted their lives. Uh, and that's what I want to ask you. What, what effect do you think you've had on your victims? A tremendous Why effect. Committing these crimes. A tremendous effect. A tremendous effect. In retrospect, yeah, in retrospect, a tremendous effect because besides the monetary value is the the um, 
it's just the uh the, the psychological point of it if somebody just coming in and just and just violating your your, your space like that i understand i understand the magnitude of what i've done I, I, I truly understand the magnitude of what I've done, and I'm truly yeah. sorry for what I've done. Yeah, because it has affected victims. I mean, you, you just think about coming home and finding your house ransacked and stuff taken, you know, you, you paranoid probably forever when you come home, there's somebody yeah. in my house, things of that nature, and we have to take all of that into account. Uh, also, I failed to mention, but Mr. Randall Myers, he's is on uh on the Zoom and he will be speaking, but the DA's office is strongly opposed. Uh transition plan. What would be your transition plan for you to get out? Where are you gonna live? Where are you gonna work? My friend here on the truck. I I, I possess a CDL license. I, I'm a truck driver, my profession, and my friend. He's on Zoom right now. He has a he, he's been having a trucking business for the last, I want to say, 15 years. He has a successful trucking business and he's guaranteeing me immediately in, immediate employment. And I'll have a paycheck coming in immediately as soon as I get out of if granted, I have an opportunity to, to, to be a taxpaying citizen okay. to be a normal person. All right. Uh... Did you have you ever held a job on the outside? Absolutely, sir. I've held I've held several jobs. I was a, I'm a veteran. I was in I was in the military. I went to the military straight out of high school. Yeah, and, I see that. And I see, I've discharged held, from the military, correct? Say again, sir. Weren't you discharged from the uh, military? Yeah, I had an under under the honorable discharge. Yeah, I had six months left. And and that was because of criminal activity, wasn't it? No, it was, it was because of my my spouse. Me and her kept getting into getting into it. She kept coming on base, getting in, we were kept fussing on base. Okay. All right. Um, you know, you have tons of arrests. I'm not I'm not even trying to go through them all. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, you're what we used to call in probation pro career criminal. I mean, you, you never go a year or so without being arrested. What, what's going to be different this time? I mean, I know you keep talking about the time over your head, but you had jobs when you're out there. You had good jobs when you were out there. Uh, and, and you can't tell me why you even committed these burglars. I mean, what was it? Was it the money? Was it the, the want to live above your standards? I mean, what what the cost? The money. I don't. I'm not. I'm. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that it was something. Like I'm not going to put this on a crutch or anything. I'm. I'm just taking full responsibility of 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 what I've done, and if and if given a chance, like I would never. I'll never come back to jail because, like I say, I don't want to. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in jail. I just, I just did. I just wasn't aware that this could happen to me, and and it happened to me. You know, I have 20 years. I'm 43 years old. It's a life sentence for me. Like my kids, I won't be able to leave my kids anything. I won't. You had 20 years as a life sentence, but you're 43 years old, so. That's the life sentence. I think we're all in well, serious yeah. trouble on this board because we're all over 60. Well, you uh, So it's not a life sentence, but I do understand. You wouldn't miss out on a lot. Uh, your classes, uh, have you taken any classes? I think you were enrolled in victim accountability. Um, are you in that class? Well, I have too much time. so. I was removed. I, I had too much time. So the people who has less time, they they get the priority. That's they get priority. Run into all the time. Uh, you risk is medium. Uh, your needs are moderate. Uh, the warden's already given his comments. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank you.
Now we'll hear from uh, those uh, speaking in, on your behalf, Mr. Eddie Moore the third. Moore? Yes, sir. I'm here, present. Would you introduce yourself, sir, and tell us what you'd like us to know? Name is Eddie Moore. Uh, I'm currently a general manager here in South Florida. I run hotels for a living. I've uh, been doing this for almost 30 plus years. I've uh, been knowing uh, Mr. Moore <laughs> uh, for some time now. Um, I do believe um, what he states that um, given a chance, he can right his wrong. I think that in life, sometimes uh, we make mistakes. We make mistakes and sometimes uh, when we make those mistakes and uh, we get the opportunity to sit and in his case, sit in jail for the period of time he's been in jail to reflect on those mistakes and how uh, those mistakes may have impacted not only the victim's lives, his lives and family lives. You get to think about those things and uh, try to right those wrongs. And then the older we get, we get more mature. We get more mature and, and uh, we make better and wiser decisions. Uh, but I am confident in him. I've been talking with him um, throughout his time in, in, in jail and, and encouraging him. And as well as uh, Mr. Delaney being able to help him in jobs, uh, I'll be able to help him in jobs as well because I did start my career down in New Orleans. So I have a lot of connections down there when it comes to hotels um, and stuff like that. I know a lot of people that would uh, help get him employed uh, if, per se, you know, something happened with one of the trucks of Mr. Delaney goes down and he's unable to work. So um, I, I'm a, um, I'll I'm be there to to assist him, to motivate him. And I do believe in him. I do believe in him. And um, because I made some, I'm, I won't sit in and tell you I made all the right decisions in my life. But, you know, I made some bad decisions, but I'm still here. And I was able to right my wrongs. And, and, and I'm, you know, I'm running a you know, $30 million company. So... Um, I understand, um, and I think that this time uh, he will do the right thing for the sake of his family, his daughter, and just for the sake of himself, uh, the sake of his own self and righting his wrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Moore. We appreciate your comments. We'll now hear from Dana Bickham. Hi, I'm Dana Bickham. I am here um, to confirm um, a resident, Sir Eric wants he, or if he is, um, paroled. I've known Eric for over 10 years and I've seen over the past three, four years speaking and talking with him, his growth, um, the mental change and to invite him into my home says a lot. Um, you know, to after the, the record that he has to be able to say, okay, you can come live with me. Um, I'm a single woman. Um, I'm doing that because I believe that he has changed. Um, talk, I talk with Eric every single day. And over the past couple of years, um, I have noticed a drastic, drastic change and he would be more than willing. I'm, I'm more than willing to let him come here um, to start his life over, um, be with his kids and help him in every aspect that I can. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beckham. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Douglas Delaney. Mr. Delaney, can you hear us? Uh, you're on mute, so yes. I can start. There we go. You can hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm Douglas Delaney. I've been owning a trucking company called Delaney's Trucking. For the past 12 years, I've been having a CDL trucking for 15. I've been owning my own company for 12 years. I guarantee Eric Moore work when he, if he re-released, he would immediately go to work. Whatever happens that he needs to do to get to that point, even getting his license renewed, whatever it takes, I'm going to be there step by step with him. I've been knowing Eric Moore my whole life. We grew up as kids together. And I'm just listening to him like they say from being in the print here now i really think he learned this lesson and like like mr eddie said i haven't been an honorable person my whole life but i was also given the opportunity to right my wrongs and i've been on a straight and narrow for almost 20 years now so if he granted parole i'll be here step by step with him and help him throughout whatever he need help out with but i guarantee him a job though immediately on release thank you guys 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, the opposition. Uh, this Nancy Norman. Ma'am, if you just you just introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to know. I'm two years because I hear a lot of people that they you know done some long things and they're doing the right things now. I never have anything like that. And he paralyzed us. And everything's small. But I walked in the house on some way and it was that's fine. And he he somehow got through our security system. We ended up having to just yeah, and we're putting over fifteen thousand dollars on our pocket because he took things that were invaluable to us that just will never be done. And then great grandmother that had passed down with children, we were down with we were in love to my mom, all disease, and her daughter. She'll never be able to get things. It, it's gone. And there was a lot he took it. I ended up my best in travels. I don't stay at home anymore. I travel all the time. It's there. It's years later. You walk in a house and you feel like you every time you I'm I'm working, you turn that key and you wait and to see is everything just for you everywhere. Is someone in there? You don't know. And I don't know why he keeps saying that he's changed. That's a lot of changing many times, apparently. He's changed a lot. He just keeps saying, I've changed. We were told the first time we took every motion, seven motion, but we were not told. He came, we, they asked us, would we be willing to get what we did? We agreed. We, we said, okay, he got offered the plea deal or trial. He took trial and was released to go to versus on that path. He ran for, I believe, almost six years with the oldest case on the back in Jefferson County. I don't think he should ever get out until his 20 years. He apparently just scared the heck out of me by saying, he wasn't on campus. So he knew where he knows where he went. I don't want him back in my church. I don't want him on the stage. Anytime, please, he's spare. I don't think this is fair. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rodney Norman. <laughs> Rodney Norman. Um, you know, I, I feel the same as my life. Both it's bad. And change the way I do on down down and to take my wife with me, which is not even convenient. It costs us a lot of money and a lot of time and effort to get a security system that has cameras inside and outside. So I live in Jefferson. It's usually a small, quiet community, and for something like this to take place is great. I don't think he should be released until he serves his 20 years. He was offered a key deal and he took it. And now he wants time off again? No. I mean, four positions. Thank you very much. Tomorrow. Good morning, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish. We are opposed to his request at this time. Uh, we feel there's been insufficient time to serve for the offense that was committed and the amount of money that he stole. And uh, we think at some point, if he's ever released his board, should order that he pay restitution uh, if, if any would be owed to any of the victims. There's strong victim opposition. He's got very poor supervision when he was under supervision previously. And he's had no program. That's one of the biggest concerns I have is the lack of programs that he's had. Uh, I believe it's only the victim accountability training letter training that he's uh, that he's undertaken, and he has a moderate risk assessment. When you look back at his criminal history, um, 
it's it's pretty extensive and he has quite a few uh domestic abuse cases over the years as well as uh aggravated offenses and, and batteries um and that's very concerning with the lack of programming to, to to kind of deal with some of those issues not completely sure you, you asked about his um uh, his release, uh, his discharge from the army, and he said it, it wasn't for thefts, it was for some issue with his wife. Um, but looking back at his record, there is an offense, and I, I don't know why he was discharged, I don't see that in the record. But he does have some theft offenses uh, dealing with the U.S. Army. Um, so for those reasons, we are opposed to his request. Thank you, um, Mr. Um, our uh, Panel way to vote, yes. Mr. Freeman. No, he was going to make a statement. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Moore. Is there anything you'd like to say before the panel votes? Yeah, I'm. I don't know why. I don't. It should be that I owe restitution. I'm willing to pay restitution. I never had a theft offense in the military, and like I say, I. The time me this time made me aware of, of 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 everything that's going on with me, and I just I'm sorry. I, I mean, if I can if I can if I can give those people everything back in ten folds, I would I would like I it never I I, I understand I understand what how do you feel. And they have the right to feel the way they feel. But if I can, if I can do something to 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 rectify this situation with them financially, I don't. I, I I'm deeply. I am deeply, deeply, deeply sorry for 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 what I put them through. Like I'm not. I'm not downplaying this by by no means. I am deeply, extremely sorry for what I put them through. It was a rational, irrational decision that I made by doing what I did. I never, I, I, I'm just sorry for what I put you guys through, and I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry for what I put you guys through. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Panel ready to vote? Yes, Mr. Freeman. Okay, Mr. Moore. Um, you're definitely very educated. Oh, I'm sorry, what, Mr. Williams. Where's Mr. Williams? Is Mr. Williams on? Your lawyer is your lawyer here, Mr. James Jim Williams. He was long then. Hi, this is Dana Bickham. He was on, but Mr. Williams called me. He's in and out of court this morning, so that may be why he um, had to leave the meeting. Okay, Mr. Uh, Freeman, you ready to vote? Right. So, as I was saying, you're very articulate. You're very smart. You have. Uh, a great job plan, a great residence plan. But the thing that's hanging me up is you've only done 4.8 years on a 20 year sentence. That's less than 25%. Plus, you have victim opposition, law enforcement opposition, and uh, you need programs. So, you know, put in for all the programming you can and then reapply when. Uh, you're eligible. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Yes, sir. You say in your closing statement that if it was in your power to give the victims everything back tenfold. Remember that? Yes, sir. You can never give them back their sense of security. They have lost that forever. Because every time one of your victims walk into their house, they get a flashback. You can never get that back to those victims. Based on a moderate <coughs> assessment, Tells us that you have a moderate chance of reoffending, a moderate 
moderate needs assessment, which tells us that you need programming to rehabilitate yourself. You have no program. Take him opposition, law enforcement opposition, opposition to the DA's office, and sufficient, insufficient time served. You've only served 24% of your sentence, which is totally insufficient for all the reasons I've just articulated. I deny your request. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rocha. Uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, you received two votes to uh, deny your parole. Uh, you know, when Mr. Freeman was initially questioning you, you spent probably uh, two, three minutes talking about your remorse. And your remorse was the fact that you were doing 20 years in prison. I never heard you say anything about being remorseful for the crimes that you committed until we started digging and trying to get that out of them. Uh, you need more programs. You need to look inside internally to see what it is you've caused to these people. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're doing 20 years. Uh, and, and I'd be worried about having to do that 20 years too. But you haven't the foggiest notion of what you've really done to them. You took victim impact, and you kind of quoted some things to us. But your remorse is because you're in prison for 20 years. And uh, I think you really need to do some soul searching before I would vote to grant your parole. So you have three votes to deny you today. Good luck to you. Can, I, can, I, can, you, can you guys, man, by me having so much time, is there any way, can you guys mandate that I get programs? We can't mandate anything, but we can recommend that you be allowed to take some programs. We'll make that recommendation. Okay. Good luck to you, sir. All right. We done? Okay. Uh, we'll be adjourned at uh, Franklin Parish Detention Detention Center. Now we can move. I'm pretty sure I've seen the board mandate it before, so I don't know if uh, but yeah, I, I you know, my takeaway too was that he really all I did hear him over and over and over again was was talking about how it's 20 years, how it's 20 years, how it feels like a life sentence, how he can't afford to have a write-up, how he can't mess up, how he can't believe that this is happening to him. And so really what Mr. O'Shea said, what Mr. Mirabella said, it, it, it uh, that was my takeaway too. You know, there's there's something that was making him wanting to steal a lot. And he'd see his his list was pretty long and interesting that that he was caught, I believe, from DNA from one of them, which I I found to be interesting that they're using DNA to do kind of minor, uh, you know. To catch someone who steals seventy five hundred bucks, they're going to actually do a D DNA. That's that's pretty that's pretty interesting, and I, maybe that's what, where one of his warrants came from, because um, he said that he he was a driver, and then he lost his job because of the warrant. It's uh, I'm trying to see if I have any any articles on on him or not. Um, let me see. If I have anything, I don't think I do. Um, I 
I don't think I do. Let me just check. I should have checked before, but because we did the back-to-back, -back, I was a little distracted. Um, but anyways, it's... Uh, The theft, it's an interesting thing. He has he has victims that actually show up to court and say, I want you to do the 20 years. And and we couldn't really hear them because of the microphone set up and they weren't talking into it. Um, but it's, would you, would you, I'm curious, would you, and we can do another one after this because I think there's one right after, so we'll do another one. But would you, like, I, I, I we've spoken about this before. Uh, with the whole theft thing, it's and and Mr. Roche spoke about this too. Um, that sense of security, I'll pay them back tenfold, but you can't ever give back that sense of security. And uh, I have a childhood memory of our home being broken into, and I don't have a lot of childhood memories, but I guess because I remember that memory, it must have affected me probably through seeing how much it affected my parents. My grandparents were recently robbed and basically um, we lost all of our, everything, every jewelry, here, all the heirlooms. I mean, the, 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 everything that was going to be passed down to us was taken. Although I learned a valuable lesson from that. My grandparents never, never, they never complain about it. My grandmother since passed away, but it's something we never, it was like it happened, and they just wrote it off. They would I never, you never, I never heard them uh, complain about that, um, weep about it, vent about it. Nothing. They're just like it happened, and I think that's part of how one can choose to react to being violated and robbed. I don't have any major person. I have you know small things. I remember I was once traveling uh, on a plane i was 16 years old and i was going somewhere and i had 500 dollars that was supposed to last me the entire trip it was like a month this was quite some time ago in the country i was going to 500 dollars could last a month and on the plane someone stole it i had it in my wallet in the little compartment in the front seat and I was sitting next to a couple of young guys. I fell asleep. I, I didn't even realize I got, you know, got off the plane, checked it, money was gone. That was a crushing feeling. Um, it was, uh, that was very upsetting. But, and then I, I know someone who's, in, who's remarkably wealthy, uh, you know, his, his, his kids and their kids are set financially for life. Um, and his business was robbed. And he had insurance. So it wasn't even a financial hit. But he, ta he, he talks about it. And he talks about the feeling of being violated. And I've, I've heard him. He, he, does, he does like TEDx type stuff. And I hear him talk about it a lot. So here's someone who's incredibly successful who is the CEO of a massive company and he had insurance, but he still, the way that it affected him, he just felt violated. So, you know, everyone handles things differently and, and, and it is very real. Um, the, on the counter argument I have is, is with restitution the, he, you know, he, 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 he is smart. Uh, he has people that have his back and will let him drive. And with the CDL license and a job, you can make good money. And the amount of money he stole, I mean, to me, it seems like he could probably pay that back with restitution, you know, in a relative amount of time. So, you know, it's like on the flip side, why couldn't you, You know why serve 20 years it's it's go pay them back go you know so okay we'll mandate the restitution we'll we'll claw it out of your out of your paycheck and um and w wouldn't the wouldn't the victims want to get that restitution 
because in this case, it looks to me like he's actually in the position to pay it off uh, and, and in a reasonable amount of time. But um, and it's not like his fault that he couldn't do any programs. He wanted to do programs, but they they because of the amount of time he had to serve, he couldn't he couldn't do any of them. But uh, I mean, I, I do understand why the board made their decision. And I also agree, I didn't hear really much remorse. It was more about the idea that he he got caught up in what he was doing and he was suffering the consequences and that's what he was regretting. And I do believe him that he will stay out of trouble because he realizes what he's up against. Um, but I also hear the argument that he just hadn't served enough time yet. But let's go do the next hearing. And also curious to know what you think. I mean, and, and, and do you think he should serve the full 20 years? I don't, I don't think so. I think 20 years is far too much or robbery, especially if he has a chance of paying back the financial. Yeah, he can never pay back what he took from them, but. Okay, so Brent Lewis from the information that Richard God, for me, it looks like he has, looks like the classic schedule to transaction proceedings and also an obstruction of justice charge. But let's jump into this. Committee on Parole is called back to order. Uh, the panel today is Mr. Alvin Roche. Uh, Mr. Pete Friedman, my name is Tony Maribel. I'll be acting as chair. The time is 10:19. Uh, Our remote location is at West Baton Rouge Parish Jail. Would the uh, staff at West Baton Rouge Parish uh, please introduce themselves? Mr. Lewis, is there anyone in there with you? Yes, sir. Deputy Morgan and Warden Stephen Juge are both present. Thank you very much. Uh, our first case is Mr. Brent J. Lewis. Mr. Lewis, would you please give us your full name and DOC number? Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brent Lewis, 520-454. Mr. Lewis, uh, let me explain our process to you. Uh, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then we're going to have a parole interview with you. At the end of that interview, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say to uh, the board, and then we'll vote. Do you understand our procedure? Yes, sir. This is a uh, Brent J. Lewis, 520-454, date of birth, December the 7th of 1983. He's a second offender. He has a, a parole eligibility date of March the 6th of 2023, an adjusted good time date of November the 20th of 2024, full term date of March 6th of 2038. He is currently serving a 20-year sentence on the charges of possession of cocaine, possession with intent to distribute oxycodone, possession of hydrocodone, possession with intent to distribute marijuana, obstruction of justice, and acquiring proceeds from drug offenses. Is that information all accurate, uh, Mr. Lewis? Yes, sir. Mr. Lewis, your case has been assigned to me, so I'll begin our uh, interview process. How old are you, Mr. Lewis? 39. Mr. Lewis, how long have you been in prison on these charges? 63 months. Tell me a little bit about uh, your criminal activity. What, what got you there? Why, why are you in prison? Um, well, when I first got out the last time, I had jobs. I had like five, six jobs, and all of them had let me go due to a background check. Nothing ever did on the job. And I mean, during that, I, I just got lost and I had to find a way to provide for myself and I just. Okay, let's talk about the last time. When did you get out of prison the last time? 2013, November. All right. And uh, how long were you in prison in 2013? Eight and a half. Eight and a half years? Yes, what sir. were you in prison for uh, in 2013? Manslaughter. Tell me a little bit about that manslaughter case. What happened? Um, at that time, I felt that I was acting out in self-defense and trying to protect my friends and my family. 
And uh, the guy, I, I just had pulled up into my neighbor's yard and we was, I was in the car and they was doing whatever they were doing. And throughout the time, a guy came outside. I don't think I know he was waving and shooting a gun. And I felt like at that time that, you know, everyone else around was in danger, so I acted. And did you go to trial or did you? Yes, sir. Guilty? I went to trial. And the jury found you guilty of manslaughter? I had a I had a bench trial with the judge and he found me guilty of manslaughter. But the judge found you guilty of manslaughter? Yes, sir. While you were in prison, did you take any kind of programs or anything while you were there? Yes, sir. I got my GED. I took every good time class that they allowed me to. I, I got free entry. I didn't finish it because I got out ahead of before the class was over with. I took in a couple other classes up in there. It's been a while. I can't remember the exact names of them, though. So tell me what happened when you got out. You couldn't get a job because they checked your background. So what did you end up doing? I ended up falling back into the streets, selling drugs. Do you use drugs? I smoke marijuana. How often would you smoke marijuana? Well, it was on a daily basis, and then as a you know kept going on, I kind of fell back off a little bit. I didn't I didn't smoke as much as I used to. Like you know, I used to smoke all day every day, and then you know the days became just right before I went to bed at night just to sleep. So you still smoked every day, just not all day every day. Yes, sir. You consider yourself to be a drug addict. Uh, not, not to the, to the point to where I have to rob and steal for it. I just, I just do it to relax and to keep my mind off of what had happened before. What do you consider a drug addict? Uh, people that'll do anything for it. So you mean you gotta be a, a criminal, you gotta rob and steal and hurt people to be a drug addict? You don't think they're drug addicts that just do drugs to feel good? Yeah, that's what I, that's what I did it for, for to relax. Well, you don't think that's a drug addict if you need it to relax? Okay. Yes, sir. Have you ever had any courses that would help explain to you what substance abuse is all about and and and, and how you 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 can treat substance abuse? Yes, sir. I just finished uh, a class not too long ago, about two months ago, three months ago. What was that class? Uh, risk management, substance tell abuse. Me, tell me, tell me what you learned in risk management. Oh, uh, that I was in a state of denial at the time, and I really didn't fully understand of the situation that I put myself in while I was doing drugs. Because you know, I I wasn't, I didn't feel like I had a problem, but you know, going through the class, I I seen that I really did have a problem with it. Well, a, a few minutes ago, when I asked you if you were a drug addict, you said that was, no. I thought you was referring to back then. I didn't know you was talking about right now. I am talking about right now. I understand that now, sir. You were a drug addict back then. You're a drug addict today. Yes, sir. But I haven't been doing anything since I've been incarcerated, though. Well, I understand that. And, and, and I realize you could probably do things while you've been incarcerated, but you're under pretty strict scrutiny as well. Yes, sir. So tell me what else you learned about... Uh, how would you stay sober if you were to get out? Well, I have I have employment. Like my mind has to be focused on something, so I have a job waiting on me to where I don't have to even depend on anything out uh, in the streets. So, well, did you ever have a job before you came to prison? No, sir. Never worked at all. Well, not before I came to prison. I, I like I said, I had five jobs before I turned to selling drugs. Okay, but but you were using drugs when yes. you had the job. Well, no, I wasn't. Not at not because they drug tested the job, so I never, I never did. So tell me how you're going to stay sober. You're going to get a job, okay? How's that going to keep you sober? You say you smoke at night, so how are you going to stay sober if uh, you get a job? I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to smoke anymore. I just That's I don't know. I, I I'm not going to I'm not going to smoke anymore cuz I don't I really that, don't Okay. To... Uh, let me let me let me stop you. Okay. You're asking me to put you back on the streets. 
Yes, sir. You smoke marijuana yes, every sir. day, you said. You reluctantly admitted you're a drug addict, but you're going to quit smoking marijuana because you're going to get a job. Well, I haven't done it in here, so I haven't had a I haven't had a a craving to do any anything up in here. It's, it's not the jail that's stopping me, it's, it's my own self-will. So stop smoking marijuana, stop doing drugs is about willpower. Yes, sir. That's what you believe. Yes, sir. Uh, tell me what other courses have you taken? What other programs have you taken while you've been in prison this time? I took in risk management. I took, uh, I think I was in the substance abuse when I was in Winfield. I took uh, nurturing Did and parenting. Did you finish that? No, they, they, I, I finished it here. I took it here. I just uh, did risk, risk that management. Is the risk substance. management program you're talking about? Yes, sir. It's the risk management substance abuse. All right. What else did you take? Uh, nurturing and parenting, anger management. And I was in a couple classes in Winfield, but they shipped me. I never got the certificate from, from my uh, anger management class in Winfield. Now, you're currently uh, work release? Yes, sir. I've been in, I've been in work. work. I work at Mike Gerald's Trailer Depot, and I cut grass for MCC, the landscaping. Have you ever gone to an AA meeting? Yes, sir. They had it. They had it here. I used to go to NAAA on uh, Saturdays, I think it was, or Sundays. It was on a weekend. It was at six o'clock. I, I used to go every day uh, on the weekends when I got off. You used to go. Why don't you go anymore? They don't have it right now. And how long did you go for? Uh, I went for at least six months. And what'd you get out of it? That. I need to start asking for help. You know, you can't do this on your own. You, know, well, you my, just told me it was all about willpower. Well, yeah, but I mean, I still need help from my family. What do you mean help from your family or help for your family? What does that mean? Well, they're they willing to, they willing to uh, sit there and talk with me and make sure that my head is on, right? You have high needs for antisocial thinking, for substance abuse, and mental health. Have you ever had any mental health treatment? Uh, like anger management or anything? Well, I, I, have you ever been to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or anyone to do a mental health evaluation on you? No, not at, not not in the world. I haven't. Not in what? Not not out not out there in society. I haven't. How about here? How about in prison? Just the classes that they offer. Have you taken any kind of medication? No, sir. So what would you do if you were released? Where would you work? I have a uh, guy willing to give me a job. He runs a construction company. His name is uh, Gary Jones. I, I, I worked, I worked uh, in construction for a little while with my pop, so I got a little, little bit of understanding. Uh, I'm looking at your record. Uh, you lost 180 days of good time in 2021. What was that about? Cell phones. What about cell phones? How many times did, were you written up? Four. All cell phones? Yes, sir. Why did you keep getting write-ups for cell phones? You knew you weren't supposed to have them, right? Yes, sir. Just through Why? the decisions I made. I can't, I can't, I don't have an excuse. It's just stupid decisions so tell me how you've changed now that you've been in prison from the person that you were when you came in 63 months ago well uh, you know from the time that i was released from prison i mean i have i have a major outlook on everything that that goes on in my life a lot of people that I had in my life, I don't have that no more because they're not the right type of people to be around. And uh, you know, when I was in, when I got out of prison the first time, I didn't have it. I didn't have what I have now. You know, I have a, a, some money saved up to where I don't have to try to rush into anything that will lead me back to the path that I was on before. So what's gonna what's gonna happen when you get out and things go bad? 
you can't get a job, the economy's going to pot, uh, and, and you find yourself back in a position where things ain't going right. How are you going to stay off the drugs? Well, like I say, uh, my family, you know, they will, they are going to help me do what I need to do to. What is it you need to do? I need to, I need to keep my mind right. You know, it, like I say, when I was smoking, it wasn't, it wasn't like I was just doing it just to do it. You know, like I said, I went to jail for manslaughter and that right there kind of messed up my head a little bit. And, you know, like I said, I just need my, my people in my corner to talk to me and, all right. Uh, what what can the staff there tell us about Mr. Uh, Lewis, if anything? Uh, hi, Warden Jude. Uh, the only thing I can tell you, you know, he hadn't had any problems at the work release, and he works two jobs. Uh, so he's he's been a been a a good good employer, a good employee and a good uh, disciplined person since he's been at our work release. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions? I have one question. Yes, sir. Mr. Lewis, uh, how much money do you have in your account at work release? I have about 7,900. That's good. Okay. So you're not blowing it on commissary all the time. Oh, no, I'm trying to think about the future when I get out. I need for, for everything that I need. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lewis, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote? I just want to um, say thank you and uh, I apologize to my uh, family for going through this again. And uh, hopefully that y'all can see that I mean everything I say from the heart. And I'm, I can honestly say I'm not coming back here if y'all let me go today. Thank you, sir. Can I ready to vote? Yes. Mr. Lewis, uh, I'm very concerned about your attitude about your drug use. You're a drug addict. You describe everything uh, as a drug addict. Uh, and I think you're still in denial. I think you need some drug treatment. I, I think you need to really come to grips with, uh, uh, with what your drug problem is. I think you need to learn more about 12 Steps. I think you need to get back into AA. Uh, sounds like you're doing well in work release. Uh, you've got a release date of uh, just a good time date of November the 20th of 2024. You'll be getting out before long. Uh, you're earning money. You're doing well. I think you need some more work on your drug, on your, your sobriety plan. Uh, I think you need to look into AA, and I think you need to realize what you need to do, what your triggers are, what your tools would be to be able to stay clean. Help your family support is important, but you need to understand that you got to go to AA meetings. You got to go to AA meetings on a regular basis for the rest of your life. Otherwise, you're going to have problems. I don't think you're there yet. Uh, I, I, I support you. I, I hope that you continue to do well, but I hope you can get some programs while you're there as well. My vote today is to deny you, but to encourage you to try to get some more uh Reports you have high needs for substance abuse, uh, mental health, and antisocial thinking, or you have law enforcement opposition. Uh, good luck to you. Thanks, Mr. Roche. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brett. Yes, sir. You have expressed opposition in the DA's office and all agencies of law enforcement. But the main reason why I'm denying you this morning is that you had disciplinary issues at each of this year transitional work program. It didn't dismiss you after the first, second, or third write up. It dismissed you and sent you to a, the parish prison after your fourth disciplinary write up in 2021. A week later, they transferred you to East, to West Baton Rouge Transition Work Program. You're doing well. I need to see a little bit more time in between the disciplinary write-ups. You didn't have one, two, or three. You had four disciplinary write-ups in one year. 
for the same thing a cell phone. Based on the necessary write ups, I deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Freeman. I concur for the same reason. Good luck to you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, it will be, is that all we have at uh, West Baton Rouge? We'll be adjourned at West Baton Rouge. Uh, thank you very much for your help. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Allen. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Good, good. How's the family? Everybody's good. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Y'all have a good weekend and happy Father's Day to y'all. You too. Thank you. Well, that was kind of scary at the end there, uh, finding out that he's high in antisocial thinking. It was so nonchalant, and I didn't expect this because this isn't why he is locked up. Uh, but when they bring up, well, why? what about your initial sentence? And, and we find out that he, oh, it's like, oh, well, there was a manslaughter charge. And it was like so non, nonchalant. He said that um, he did it in self-defense. Now, I, I do, I, I'll put the link in the description. I won't go through it, but it is his appeal from his uh, from his bench trial with the judge, which I always question. I, I, I think if I was in the worst case scenario, I think I'd rather the coin flip of a jury than to trust a judge. And I have one experience in court going to a, uh, it was a small claims thing. And I had an arbitrary, an arbiter. And my experience with the arbiter was awful. Basically, she, you could tell she was just burnt out, didn't want to be there, had no passion for her job or doing anything, you know, and she awarded both of us, me and the other person in the arbiter, both of our claims, which made no sense because you, you couldn't award both. It was one or the other. One of us was lying, right? Um, and I, I, I had like sued the person for, it was like $483.26. It was like the exact amount of money. And the reason that I had sued was not for the money, but it was because he was going around telling people that I had owed him money and I didn't like that. In reality, he had owed, he had owed me money. So I said, you know, I'm going to take you to small claims court when, because I have all the proof and, and, and that's all I would need to show people. I didn't care about the money. I just need to like, I did not, I do not owe you anything. You actually owe me and I'm going to go and just take this to the legal court. And I agreed to do the arbiter, the, and he countersued me for the maximum of 5,000. And she, what it was is she like sat with us for 20 minutes. I had brought, you know, the receipts, the proof, the contracts, you know, everything that we had. Oh, because it was like, we were like roommates, you know? So that's how these things can go wrong. And he just said, oh, he owes me $5,000. He, he didn't come with any. And she awarded both of us. So. I had to pay him 5,000 and he had to pay me 473. And after that experience, I was just so turned off. I would never trust a single person. Uh, that, that was my first real legal experience um, in courts. And I, I just ruined, like, I, I just couldn't, at that point, I'm like, I, I can never trust a, a court system again. Um, I digress. So the, he did take someone's life and he got a 10 year sentence and then he appealed saying that it was excessive, which I don't know how getting 10 years for manslaughter can be considered excessive, but the, it was, so he, he went to a house to buy illegal Pepsi Cola. 
basically. And there were a bunch of other people there. Then it was like, now it's like five in the morning and they're all getting in their cars to leave. So there's like multiple cars. He's in his own car and his victim um, went into some type of episode, pulled out his weapon and started shooting, going bang, bang in the ear. And I'm using these silly words for the YouTube algorithm. I'm not to demean the seriousness of what was happening. And uh, because YouTube will just, oh, you, 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 whatever. They're a joke now. Um, and he basically starts yelling, everyone get out of my way, get him out of my way, because their cars are boxed in in the same driveway and, and the um, Clark's car was in front of him. And then, so after he goes bang, bang in the ear, he goes into his car and then he starts drive, trying to get out of the driveway and he hits Clark's car like once and then reverses and hits it twice. And I think at that point, Clark gets out of his car with his weapon of 44 Magnum and he starts firing into the car. And then he actually goes right to the driver's side door, fires in there, then pulls open the door, and then a bunch of guys jumped on the victim and started um, going at it on the victim. And uh, and then the victim went, ended up going in the, in the passing away in the hospital. The, the surgeon couldn't couldn't stop the bleeding because the the artery they couldn't clamp it. It was like in a location they couldn't clamp it. So, you know, you might argue um, it's probably because of those circumstances the judge gave 10 years and not more because, you know, hoot. but, uh, and the guy had a lot of stuff in his system. Um, and, you know, psychiatrist came there as references and said, yeah, he was probably having a man manic episode. He thought that everyone was out to get him. So, you know, but, but that was the situation that he got the, the 10 years uh, manslaughter for. I'll put that link in there if you want to check it out. Um, But, uh, I mean, good for him that he's on work release. You know, he's not stuck. At, you know, at least he's able to do work release. At least he is able to save up his money. It's not, you know, we see people that are locked away and they're just kind of rotting away. But here he gets to continue to put money away. And hopefully he can stay out. But, man, I always get, I always get nervous when I hear about the high on antisocial behavior. That's, that's scary stuff. Um, but anyways, I think this is, this is a good time to stop it and I don't know. Do you want to do one more? Could do one more. Um, Let's see. I suppose we could do one more. Let's see, what is he in for, Dylan? Uh, it's another possession type charge. It's an interesting jail. Let's do one more. I know it's getting late, so mods, I know that you're tired. I can take over from here if you can't make it. Um, let's jump in. But I know you guys are troopers. You can do it. Committee on parole is called back to order. The time is 1041. Uh, members of the panel today, Mr. Alvin Roche, Mr. Uh, Pete Freeman. My name is Tony Marabella. I'll be acting as chair. Our remote location is at St. Tammany Parish. Would the staff at St. Tammany please introduce themselves? Corporal Jonathan Lott. Thank you very much. Our first case is going to be Mr. Dylan Archer. 
Mr. Archer, would you give us your full name and date of birth, please? I mean, uh, DOC number. Dylan Bradford Archer, DOC number 526920. Thank you, sir. Mr. Archer, let me explain our process to you. I'm going to read some information into the record, then we're going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will allow those persons who wish to have input to have their say. Uh, present today and speaking on your behalf is your mother, Ms. Cynthia Giordana, and uh, your father, Mr. Dave Archer. And uh, also present is your stepmother, Ms. Belinda Archer, but she will not be speaking. At the end of that hearing, uh, we'll give you an opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say to the board, and then we'll vote. You understand our procedure, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. This is the matter of Dylan B. Archer, uh, DOC number 526920. Uh, DOC number, uh, I mean, uh, date of birth is July the 20th of 1987. He's a fifth class offender. He has an adjusted good time date of April the 5th of 2025, a parole eligibility date of July 3rd, 2022, he, and a full term date of July 4th of 2025. He is currently serving a four-year sentence on a violation of a protective order, having been adjudicated a habitual offender. A sentencing date was November the 8th of 2021. Is all of that accurate, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Uh, Archer? Yes, sir, it is. Uh, your case has been assigned to Mr. Alvin Roche. Would you please answer any questions he might ask? Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Archer. Good morning. How are you doing? Uh, I'm uh, okay, thank you. No nervous. A little nervous. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing. Okay. Can you hear me now? I, I can. I just have to turn up the volume. Back up. Okay. Can you hear me now? I, I can, but we're, 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 he's turned the volume up. There we go. We're back on line now. I can hear you fine. Can you can hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Archer, you're currently 35 years old. Yes, sir. Is that, is that correct? Yes, sir, it is. And you've been incarcerated for about two years next month. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you're a fifth? Felony offender. At the age of 33 years old, you were convicted up for your fifth felony. Tell me exactly why so much criminal activity in 15 years after your 18th birthday. Tell me what was going on. Well, well, sir, when I was when I was younger, I. I, I made a few, I made a mistake and um, I, I had a burglary charge. Um, it was a, it, it really, it was a, a simple burglary charge. Um, after that, I, I, I straightened my life up. I, I had a, I got a children. I had children and I, I had a relationship with a woman I've been with since I was 22. And a lot of my other problems had stemmed from that. I, I got in trouble for um, violation of protection order from her a few times, and we would continue to get back together and try to make our family work. Mr. And, Arthur, I want to stop you right there. It's more, yes, than, it's more than a few times. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, it has I been count, quite a few times. I, I, count, I count maybe four or five violations of protective order. You say you've been in a relationship with this person for the last 13 years. Why has she filed for protective violence against you? We, we would argue and she would use the protection order to get me to, to, to leave the house. And I would, I, I would come back, we'd get back together and the protection orders would still be in place. And and I I was young I wasn't thinking how how serious it was and I know now for certain that it's not anything to play with 
and that tell me the primary reasons why she filed a protection order against you and, she, and be truthful uh, yes sir for for yelling and arguing in front of the children for because I had used, um, drank too much or used drugs in the past, many years ago, uh, when my daughter was first born in 2014. No, uh, no physical altercation? No, sir. I have never been uh, physically, I have never been physical with her, never put my hands on her. So, evidently, you can't get along. She was protective orders, why do you continue with the relationship? Because of my children, sir. And because I had built a life with her and I used that to keep myself out of trouble from doing anything else that was wrong. It was it was like my my safe zone, you know, to so to speak, even though it, it turned out to not be so safe, it was what was keeping me out of the, you know, uh, trouble with, other people. It kept me secure at home. It kept me doing the right thing all the time. And okay, okay, okay. Now, I see where you completed one program, anger management. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And I've also completed living in balance. Okay, great. Did you just, did you just say living in balance recently? Yes, sir. I have I just uh, finished it um, um, since I've been here. Since I was um, sent back to this facility, right when I got here, I finished living in balance. Um, that was about, I'd say, a month ago. Okay, so basically, you've knocked, you've knocked another six months off your sentence. Is that correct? I've knocked another three months off of my sentence with that class. Well, I think you, did you complete both parts of living in balance? I've completed one part of living in balance, sir. When will you start the second part? I'm I'm uncertain of that. There's two parts of that program. Yes, sir. There is two parts of that program. So when you finish the second part of it, you will knock another ninety days off. Yes, sir. So after you finish that, your uh, good time date should be sometime in late twenty twenty four. Yes, sir. Okay. Now. What is your current job assignment at St. Tammany? I don't have one here, sir. Um, is Corporal Lott in the room? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay, is, is there a living in balance part two at St. Tammany? Uh, I can reach out to our programs director and I'll get right back with you, sir. Okay, let me know, okay? He wants an yeah, yeah. Are you a trustee at St. Germany? No, um, no, sir, I'm not. I have been everywhere else, but I, I have I am not here. Um I, I have I have been taking some uh correspondence courses from um uh Blackstone Paralegal and uh I've been I've been taking it for about uh, for 10 months now. I okay. sent in a certificate that I had um, I had uh, accomplished um, yeah. uh, personal injury and, and torts. Yeah, we, we do have that. Okay. Now, you've been at you you've been at St. Kevin's since January of 2023. Uh, so the next living in balance review will be taken. Okay. Right. Now, right. have you requested any more programs at St. Kevin? Oh yes, sir. I've Which program? Um, to be in any any programs that I can that I'm eligible for, sir. What's your job assignment? Uh, right now, I don't have one. I don't have a job assignment here. So, what do you do all day? I, I just I just basically sit in this dorm and I, I study my uh, paralegal work and help these guys, you know, with uh, anything they need with writing and stuff. Let's talk about your supervision history. Mr. Roche. Yes. I hate to interrupt. I just spoke with our programs director. The next living in balance they do will be a living in balance too. Great. And 
Will he be enrolled in that class? Yes, sir. I have no, I have no way of knowing. Okay, I'm going to make sure that he enrolls in that class. Okay, thank you. Um, let's talk about your supervision history. You've been on supervision multiple times. Am I, am I correct? Yes, sir. And you've not done very well. No, is sir. That, is that a good statement? It's, it's, it's a factual statement. The factual statement. You were revoked in 2007. You were revoked in 2009. You were revoked in 2016. And you just got revoked in April of 2021. So yes. why should I put you back on supervision when you failed every time you get on supervision? I won't make the same mistakes again, sir. And I, I'm I'm ready to get my life together and move on. It's, I'm 35 years old and I'm ashamed of myself at this point. I'm, I'm tired of making my family feel like they are, you know, they have a son that isn't doing anything with himself. And for my child, I have a little girl that I wanted to make, I want to make her proud of her father. Okay. Now, tell me, where your mindset was, you've been arrested for a lot of violent offenses, aggravated battery, disturbing the peace, simple assault, remaining after forbidden, resisting a police officer with force, in violation of protective orders four or five times. Where did all the violence come from? Sir, to be, to be honest with you, I, I would like to say that the, the, the aggravated battery I was proved innocent of. I, uh, that, sir, but you were arrested. I, yes, sir, I was arrested. And, that, that's, uh, um, and I, I have never um, truly been, I had a um, uh, resisting arrest with force because I, I, I pulled away from the officer. I, I'm not a violent person at all. And so why why did you plead guilty to telephone harassment, improper telephone communication, and simple criminal criminal damage to property? Improper I I don't believe that I have ever been found guilty of of telephone harassment unless that's in, inside of a protection order. Uh, sir. Speak when I ask you a question, okay? Yes, sir. January, January 23rd, 2019, St. Tammany Sheriff's Office arrested for telephone harassment, simple damage to property under $1,000, improper telephone communications, two counts. October 30, 2019, Archer pled guilty as charged and was sentenced to six months in parish jail. Is that not true? I'm, 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 I guess that is true. Yes, sir. Two days later, you are arrested again for violating a protective order, second offense, domestic abuse, aggravated assault. You said you've never been arrested for domestic abuse that I've seen here. Simple criminal damage to property, hit and run, simple assault, and another count of improper telephone communication. May I speak, sir? Yes, you may speak, but what I'm saying is, I see that on your rap sheet. Is that the same charge as I just said? 
I think that that is is all what happened at one time, sir. And 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 even though it has, I'm not minimizing anything. It says um, um, aggravated domestic uh, assault is, is because I placed the woman in fear of, uh, in apprehension. I, I never actually put my hands on her or anything like that. There's a mother of my child, and I, I would never do something like that to my children's mother. Or, or, you know, I wouldn't have my children looking at me like this. Uh, and, feel like and, and two years passed in 2021, you were arrested again for violating a protective order. It's a constant thing. It's a repeat, same charge, same individual. When are you going to see that you have an unhealthy relationship and it's bringing you down and causing you to be incarcerated? Yes, sir. I, I understand that now, sir. And I, I went a long time without even seeing my child, my little girl, and it's, it's yeah. everything within myself I want to do right so I can be a good father to my child. Mr. Archer, I have a idea I want to give you some much needed domestic abuse programming. Yes, sir. Programming will help you to recognize situations, help you to diffuse the situations, and maybe just maybe you can take an unhealthy relationship and use the techniques that you will receive in this program to work towards making it a healthy relationship. And if you recognize that it's not able to be a healthy relationship, you might want to end the relationship. Yes, sir. Are you willing to go to this program? Yes, sir. I, I think that that would help with also with me getting uh, rights to my child and, and, you know, my custody rights and everything. So it would, it would. The, the ladies here had uh, had suggested this to me and had um, told me that they was going to they were going to. Um, put this in my paperwork upon my release. Oh, that's all right. I will order it, it this morning. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. When the parole board orders a program, DOC will 100% of the time agree with our recommendation. So thank you. Good. Uh, let's hear from uh, your father, Mr. Dave Archer. Mr. Archer, if you would uh, tell us what you'd like us to hear. We're having trouble with the connection, sir. Yes. You're frozen. Is Miss uh, Cynthia Giordana on the line? Maybe we can go to her and try to. Yeah, she needs to. Yeah, she was in. She... No, she's in. She just. Uh, Miss Giordana, can you hear us? I don't know. Uh, I camera. Ms. Jordana, can you hear us? I'm trying to unmute. Can you hear me now, sir? Uh, who is this speaking? This is David Archer. Mr. Archer, we can hear you, but we but you're frozen on our screen. So go ahead and tell us what you'd like to tell us about your son. Uh, to confirm, you can you can hear me now. Yes, sir, I can hear you, but we can't see anything. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on. It's delayed, it's you know. Uh, 
Yes, sir. Uh, what I'd like to say is uh, Dylan has been attending this uh, paralegal course, and I spoke with the people at Blackstone Career Institute, and he, at the present time, he has a 92.38 grade point average. They're expecting a couple more courses to come soon. Uh, on behalf of uh, his repeated issues with, you know, violating a restraining order is no excuse for it. But as men, sometimes we think we can fix things if we if we communicate. But uh, if the other party doesn't want to hear it, then it's a mute point. So uh, I just wanted to throw that tidbit out there. I understand him trying to fix and trying to keep his little family together, but sometimes things aren't meant to be. But I, I think he's uh, learned his lesson. And uh, I'd like to see him get out and be productive and be uh, instrumental in his daughter's life. Thank you, Mr. Archer. We appreciate your comments. Ms. Jordana? Yes. Ms. Jordana, can you hear us? Cynthia Jordana. Can you see it? Can you hear us, ma'am? Ms. Jordana, can you hear us? You're on mute, ma'am. We can't hear you. Uh, Mama must not have. Um... No, just lost her. Is that Miss Jordana? That part's out here. Ms. Jordana, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, we were having some technical problems with uh, seeing you and hearing you. Why don't you go ahead and tell us what you'd like to tell us about your son? Well, first of all, I think he's a great person. He's been my favorite since he was a baby. He's intelligent. He has a lot of motivation to do better for himself. He's educating himself while he's in there to get better jobs. And when he gets out, he can you know, be around a better group of people. Um, he's, you know, made some mistakes, he thought he was doing the right thing and, you know, trying to get back with his family, but that's not the way things work nowadays. And I just know he's a good person and, and, you know, he's willing to try and do his best to, you know, to continue to get on with his life. You know, he just, his, his life is just wasting in there and he has a lot of potential. He's highly intelligent. He just made a mistake trying to keep a family and that's not the way you do things nowadays. Thank you very much, ma'am. We appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thank you for calling me. Uh, you're welcome. Mr. Uh, Archer, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote? Um, yes, sir. Um, I'm glad to have made it here. It's, it's been, it's been, um, being at these facilities like this, it, it's, it's quite difficult to stay out of trouble sometimes, especially when you're locked in the back with these people, you know, I've done everything I could to, to make it this far. And as you've seen, I had a, a write up in my, um, in my file a year ago and, um, I finally made it here in front of y'all. And I, I'm hoping that, you know, y'all have, uh, see that I've, I've, 
done everything I can to change and, and to better myself at this point. And I'm, I'm much, I feel like I'm much older now and I need to get out of here and move on with my life. And, um, and I'm willing to go through any classes I can to, to, um, to get out and, and, and help me with getting custody rights to my child. Uh, I have to totally restart my life now. I have no house and or anything, but my family is willing to help me. Um, I'm I'm lucky for that. And uh, just want to thank y'all. Thank you, sir. Panel ready to vote? Yes, Mr. Roche. Mr. Archer. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask you one question before I vote. And I don't need anything but a number. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. You said you had a write up. How many months ago was that write up? That write up was. I, I, just, I just need a number. The write up I had. The 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 write up I had that I was in trouble for was over a year ago, for fighting. That I, I went to, I went to DB court on it. I was found I, guilty. Sir, 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 sir. Please. I said all I needed was a number. Oh yeah. Uh. It's a lot. Can you help me with that? So you said it was 12 plus months ago. What? 14 months ago. 14 months ago, Mr. Lott Thank says. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Lott, I believe, yes, every, I believe every word that your mother and your father just said, you are trying to keep your little family together. But sometimes you, you gotta get just a little bit older and 35 to realize no matter what you do, if you don't get cooperation from your partner, you do them a favor. So you need to reevaluate that relationship and then decide what you're going to do. But I want to tell you that you can have a very healthy relationship with your children without being in a relationship with their mother. No. The courts can provide that you have visitation or even custody of those children but the relationship is getting in the way with that wholesome relationship with your children. So you can have what you want without being in a relationship. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Yes, sir. And yes, sir. hopefully this domestic violence prevention program that I'm ordering you to go to will help you in your decision-making uh, process about your children and your relationship. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my vote is to grant conditionally upon completing the Bolger Medium Domestic Violence Prevention Program because he needs the training, conditions as release, you have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. I want you to do community service, four hours a month. Get with your parole officer, and he will help you to figure out what kind of community service you will render. And I want you to enroll in ongoing anger management classes for one year after release. I want you to reinforce a training you got in anger management so you don't uh, 
in that in this situation again. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Hey, Mr. Rochelle, Mr. Uh, Freeman. Uh, I agree. That's what you need. Uh, but I'm gonna add the condition that um, anytime you go to see your little girl, uh, have somebody with you. Your mother, father, whomever. So you know, we'll have more facts as to what goes on, and they may be able to defuse a situation before it gets out of hand. So uh, good luck to you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Archer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Archer, I agree with my colleagues. Uh, your your uh, parole has been conditionally granted upon your enrolling and completing. The Bossier uh, DVPP program, domestic violence uh, program, uh, as well as uh, once you're released, uh, you're to have a curfew, uh, community service work, uh, anger management uh, classes for at least a year afterwards, and uh, only visit your daughter with supervision. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. That was a totally different kind of hearing than I, <laughs> you know, you see it all. I, I'm confused about this one. I, I really am. I, uh, I mean, it starts off, I think it was five felonies. And you're just expecting a much different kind of rap sheet. And then Mr. Roche asks him to start off. And he so he starts with first that robbery. And then was it the other four felonies are all the are all the same offense? For violating a protection order, it's just, it's just, it's almost like it's bizarre. All with the same woman? I mean, is that really what we just heard? This man has five felonies, but four of them are for going back to his wife and then she keeps calling the cops on him and he keeps violating the and going back to prison. Is that really what's happening here? That's crazy if it is. I mean, there's two sides to every story, right? His, hers, and the truth. He insists that he's never actually had done anything to physically hurt her that the violations were put on her because he was fighting with her in front of his daughter. But man, what's the, the Albert Einstein saying? Insanity is definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. This would be the poster child, I think, for that. For that definition. Or I mean, if you believe it, I, I just it's hard to believe but you know, it was interesting, both his father and his mother, it's really nice to see parents come on and support their child and have their back, and that's a beautiful thing. But I wonder how much of it is enablement, unless it's just not, you know, unless he really is just kind of obsessed with this woman who is kind of playing games with him. I mean, is that a possible scenario? He does have anger problems. I guess he, he doesn't seem to really deny that. He yells in front of his child. 
But I think what is very clear to everyone is that they are not meant to be together ever. And Mr. Freeman was spot on with making the condition that someone be there during the visits because if that condition was not in place, you know he's ending up back inside of prison with an, yet another felony. Yeah, this might be one of the more bizarre. I don't know. What do you guys think? You think that it's possible that, that this type of relationship scenario can exist? Or do you think that he's there's a little bit more that we're not seeing here? The board didn't seem to really dive into that. They just took for what he was saying at face value. We don't have any pictures or accusations, I guess, of actual physical abuse, right? But man, it's just violating violation of a protection order. So, can you it, you you just put yourself in the shoes? It's like, okay, it could happen. It can happen once, right? Like I get it. But then the second time, then a third time, and then a fourth time. I mean, <laughs> when do you draw the line? How many times does a police officer come there and handcuff you and book you? For felony, nonetheless. How has it come down to a felony? I don't understand. Wow. I mean, everyone would know him at this point. The judge, the DA, the police. I know him by first name basis. Oh, it's him again. You're back. Uh, like they said, he's an intelligent guy, right? And it's uh, people are very fascinating creatures. We uh, are complex people. We are complex beings. We don't we don't make sense a lot of the time. But it's been a lot. It's of that note. We've been together for two hours and eighteen minutes or something. So with that, I will let you go. Have a really good night. Thank you, mods, for doing an awesome, awesome job. As always. I love you all. With that, I'll let you go.